This lecture will review indirect approaches to assessment. So at this point, you should be aware that there are three methods to conducting a functional behavior assessment. And those include indirect assessment, descriptive assessment, and functional analysis. So the characteristics of an indirect assessment include making attempts to gather information about a client's behavior through means other than direct observation. So essentially what we're doing here is either conducting a record review, uh, for example, uh, reviewing a referral packet, we're conducting interviews with individuals who know the client well, parents, teachers, direct care staff, and we may even conduct or complete checklists and or rating scales. <clears throat> and we'll go over a couple of those shortly. The major strength of this approach is that it's a very simple approach. It doesn't require any special training to, to review records and administer one of these behavioral checklists or rating scales. So in that sense, some of the early literature presented this approach as, as a means to shortcut the functional analysis. <clears throat> and you, you still see this in practice today. That is, some practitioners will only complete an indirect assessment. And this is, this is um, unacceptable because the major weakness of these assessments is that they're very subjective. The reliability and validity of these assessments <clears throat> are, are su suspicious as well, and they're not adequate for designing treatment. So this is a major problem in the field of behavior analysis nowadays. Um, and, and I, speaking anecdotally, meaning without real evidence, but through observation, it seems to be an artifact of large caseloads. So for example, a BCBA working in a school or probably a school district may be the only BCBA in that district. And he or she may have to serve um, upwards of 20 to 30 individuals who require some form of behavioral support, whether it's specialized teaching methodologies based on behavior analysis, or in, in this area, some form of a functional behavior assessment and intervention to reduce problem behavior. So with the caseload so large, conducting a functional analysis becomes quite a challenge. So again, as, as I mentioned, sort of an artifact of that seems to be that more and more practitioners are starting to just do indirect assessments. And, and if you pair that with the fact that school administrators and parents may not be up to speed on the best assessment approach, this may seem sufficient to them. But uh, again, we know, and I want to drive this point home, that, that this is not sufficient. We cannot just do an indirect assessment. That said, it does tend to be a good starting point. So in any behavioral consultation, we are going to conduct, we're, we're going to gather background information. So we're going to conduct some form of an interview and a record review. So the purpose of that or the goal would be to just simply gather background information, not only on the client, so things like diagnosis and uh, age and <clears throat> where they go to school, variety of other sort of demographic information, pieces of information. Uh, but more specifically for us as behavior analysts, we want to, after we get all that preliminary information or background info, we wanna move on to understand what is the problem? Why are we being consulted? So for example, what are the target behaviors? We can begin to formulate operational definitions by reviewing records and conducting interviews. <clears throat> and then uh, we could gather some preliminary information on the intensity and frequency of these targeted behaviors begin to generate hypotheses about behavior function by beginning to understand, well, what are the antecedent conditions and what are the consequences that seem to be uh, surrounding or influencing these targeted behaviors? 
And then, of course, we want to gather information like uh, understanding client preferences or, or, or reinforcers that are used by the caregivers. We could determine the client's skills and strength. That's always very useful. Uh, can, they, can they engage in verbal behavior? Can they vocalize? Uh, or is that a skill deficit? So that, that would have some implication for a behavior reduction intervention, what skills they have. Uh, and then at a, a, a basic level, it helps us establish a rapport, not only with the clients, but the other individuals involved, parents, teachers, um, direct care staff. And I wanna underscore the importance of developing this rapport. Uh, I, in a separate lecture, I'll provide an overview of interview strategies and, and things that we'd want to gather during an interview. You'll, you'll get a little bit of that with this presentation, but this notion of establishing rapport is incredibly important. And it begins during this initial step when we first make contact with what, 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 who I'll call the stakeholders, who, who's invested in this uh, changing this, this client's behavior. And the reason I say it's critically important is because eventually we will get to a point where we are asking them to change their own behavior, whether it's collecting data for us, whether it is uh, beginning to train them or, or before we get there, whether it's to include them in the assessment process. Uh, after we develop an effective intervention, we're going to train them to run that intervention. So by establishing this rapport, we're going to get buy-in on the front end. So we need to really put our best foot forward. Uh, it, it, some of you may be, be familiar if you're working in settings with behavior analysts. Uh, we don't always have the best reputation because we ask people to do additional work, right? So uh, we, we always talk about balancing the need for comprehensive data with the 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 sort of labor involved in doing that work. So <clears throat> we wanna establish a very positive rapport. Um, the interview can be free form, but there are structured interview tools available like the child behavior checklist. Uh, we're, we're not gonna review those specifically, but uh, we will review some rating scales. But again, this is step one in the behavioral consultation. Who do we interview? Well, if, uh, if, if we gather, if we get the client through a referral source, uh, for example, in New Jersey, the state has a system, it's referred to as Perform Care, for referring children for behavioral services, in-home behavioral services. And if you receive a referral from them, there's usually some, some general background information, the age of the, the child, the uh, diagnosis, and what the presenting problems are. Sometimes referral information is not always the, the most robust source of data, but it is a good starting point. Um, <clears throat> we'd want to interview parents if they're available, teachers, paraprofessionals. We could interview the client, uh, certainly if, they, if they're capable of understanding our questions and responding. And you know anybody who has a stake in the individual's success, right? So um, I'll, I'll I'll point this out probably in other courses, but maybe maybe throughout this course, the client is our main focus. Our our main responsibility is to improve the life of that client and advocate for that client. But inevitably, we end up working with all of these other individuals, the parents, the teachers, we're, we're, we're educating them on our process. We are <clears throat> asking them to do things, as I mentioned, and eventually we're going to hand off the successful interventions to these people. So we got to get it buy in on the front end. <clears throat> and these are the people we're going to be interfacing with. So structured interviews. This is basically, again, a form of an indirect assessment. They can be used during an interview to help guide your questions. And again, as already discussed, these interviews are designed to gather all that background information. But more specifically, we want to target 
and drill down on all the information or all the data related to the problem, the presenting problem. Is it aggressive behavior? Is it out of seat behavior? Is it off task behavior? And then of course, we wanna get as much information as we can about those targets. How often do they occur? Where do they occur? Under what conditions do they occur? Under what conditions do they not occur? When we get to the, the, um, the rating scales and checklists, you'll see that there are specific questions that, that, that are designed to gather that information. <clears throat> so we're gonna get all this information and hopefully generate a hypothesis about the behavior function. Now, again, this is step one. We're not going to end here. Um, we need to gather this information and begin to formulate our assessment approach and maybe even begin to think about intervention. Um, this is an area, th this is sort of a, a procedure, a process that other areas of psychology would call case conceptualization, right? So how are we conceptualizing the problems? And we're going to uh, base our conceptualization of the problem on this information that we're receiving. And it's going to guide us into our assessment process. How So I have this idea about what's happening. How am I actually going to thoroughly understand what's happening? And then, of course, the main goal is to identify the function of the problem behavior. So again, we're talking about uh, challenging behaviors in, in this class. So um, that's going to be the focus. But even if we were doing skill acquisition work, the interview would be step one. The indirect assessment would be step one. So it's always included in the, uh, the overall assessment process or included as part of a functional behavior assessment. But in an FBA, it is not the ending point. It's sort of the beginning. Um, so it guides a, the development of a functional analysis. If, I'm, if I get information about the, the targeted behaviors, it might lead me to determine, well, what conditions am I going to run, right? I want to try to abbreviate my functional analysis. So the interview information might help me determine whether I need to run four conditions, um, demand, attention, alone, control, or can I just run two conditions, demand versus control, right? I should be able to, to narrow it down through these, these uh, interviews. Uh, and then, of course, it might specify specific antecedents and consequences. So uh, when we talked about functional analysis, you, you probably recall me mentioning the type of demands that are used, right? If it's a child having a problem in an academic setting, maybe the demands we use in the FA are academic demands. We would get that information from this structured interview. If... Um, if we learn from the parents that the demands are uh, demands related to a physical examination from a healthcare professional, then we want to try to replicate those demands in a functional analysis. So, you know, we're getting that information here. It's not just that we're, we, we use these generic antecedent conditions and consequences in our FA. We try to tailor them to simulate what's happening in the, the natural setting. And again, you'll hear me say this multiple times. These interviews are not effective for identifying the function or developing treatments. So it, it's, um, it is our starting point. There are checklists and rating scales that have been developed and developed by uh, behavior analysts and other types of psychologists like school psychologists. And there are many of them that, that exist. That, um, a few popular ones would be the Motivational Assessment Scale designed by Durand and Crimmins, the Functional Analysis Screening Tool by De Leon and Awada, uh, Questions About Behavioral Function by uh, John Matson and Tim Vollmer, and uh, Problem Behavior Questionnaire, uh, I believe, uh, George Sugai. We're not going to go over uh, the problem behavior questionnaire, but we will talk a little bit about the motivational assessment scale, uh, a little more about questions about behavioral function or QABF, and a lot about the FAST. 
So the motivational assessment scale is a very popular um, checklist used to generate a hypothesis about the function of behavior or the situations in which behavior occurs. And one of the things you'll notice about this assessment tool, as well as the other ones that follow, is they are quite similar in that they list basic questions that you are to ask uh, a parent or a teacher to rate according to some Likert scale. Uh, so this one would be zero, uh, that this is never the case, to six, always the case, and then you know some variation in between. So uh, if we were to take one of these questions, imagine me asking the parent, would the behavior occur continuously over and over if the person were left alone for long periods of time, for example, several hours. And then the parent would say, uh, almost never, that would occur. Then I'd move on. Does the behavior occur following a request to perform a difficult task? Maybe they report almost always a five. So I'm gonna go through and complete the questionnaire according to this way. Now, other folks will, um, will simply just give the form to a parent or a teacher and ask them to fill it out. I personally, if I were to use this, I, I would not use this tool, I'll, I'll tell you now, but um, if I were to use a tool like this, I typically ask these questions. Um, but again, you can read the directions and so forth. And we want to do one of these for each target behavior. That's sort of the, the common practice. So if we were to look at this scale, there are 16 questions and subsets of these questions are designed to address a category of behavior function. So social positive reinforcement in the form of attention, social positive reinforcement in the form of access to a tangible, social negative reinforcement in the form of escape or avoidance, and uh, automatic reinforcement, automatic positive to be specific, in the form of sensory stimulation. So the questions that are being asked are, are designed to get at these functions, maybe by way of uh, antecedent conditions related to the function, or specifically, are you delivering this type of reinforcer? If the behavior occurs, do you provide attention, right? So the questions are like that. And as I mentioned, it's a Likert scale. Right, so you have some range of possible responses and there's calculations involved to determine the function. Um, we're not gonna get, get into the details of that article. You could, you could certainly read the article if you have an interest, but uh, I will give you the cliff notes of an article that followed and basically it, the, the title says it all. Reliability anal analysis of the motivation assessment scale, a failure to replicate. So this was conducted by Jen Zarconi, who's a student of Brian Awada, and um, she basically replicated the procedures of Duran and Crimmins, the, the published study that, that presented the mass. So in the introduction of this article, which was not assigned, um, they state the functional analysis is very comprehensive. We consider it the gold standard, right? So any of these new procedures that uh, researchers or practitioners are coming up with as assessment tools need to be compared to the functional analysis. And just to sort of make that more clear, we would, if we have, if you and I developed a new tool, we would have to make sure that when we complete that tool with the client, the results match the results of the functional analysis. If we did that, let's just say, for example, uh, with a sample of 500 individuals and uh, out of those 500, 400 of our uh, new tool compared to the FA corresponded in the results, then we could simply say, hey, this new tool is the way to go, um, right? So we're, we're, we're establishing the validity of the tool. Hopefully that makes sense. So they state the functional analysis is great, but it requires therapists to conduct assessment sessions, well-trained observers to collect data, and a controlled environment. Now, uh, this article is dated because we'll, 
we know and we'll, we'll talk about more the fact that all of these areas have been addressed and don't always uh, the, the critique or the criticism doesn't stand up by today's standards but nevertheless uh, it is much easier to conduct the functional analysis when you have a trained therapist who's done FAs to do these sessions and you have people to collect data for you. Now, um, some of the settings I worked, worked at, we had these resources. Other settings I've worked at, those resources do not exist. So you are running functional analysis sessions yourself and collecting the data and the environment is not controlled. So a little bit more messy, but nevertheless, you can do it. So th they make that case in the introduction that the FA is a gold standard, but it's tough to do for some people, some practitioners. So therefore, there are alternative methods that uh, maybe should be explored. And they mention indirect assessments. And the, the, big, the big strength of this approach is it might reduce time and effort in conducting assessments, right? If we could just do an interview or we could just complete a rating scale and successfully identify a function that we could design a successful intervention upon, that would be fantastic, right? Because an FA uh, does require a lot of effort, whereas answering some questions does not. So the purpose of Zarconi's study was to systematically replicate Duran and Crimmins, and then they did another additional analysis that was considered more stringent. So their general method was they had two samples, uh, an institutional sample that consisted of 39 individuals um, with severe to profound mental retardation, all of whom engaged in SIB, and a school setting with adolescents and adults with severe developmental disabilities, all of whom engaged in SIB. The raters uh, who administered the MASS, the Motivational Assessment Scale, included two staff members, teachers, or teacher's aid. And um, some of you may not be familiar with uh, reliability analyses, but what we're trying to do there, what, what researchers will try to do is to establish the reliability of a instrument like the, the motivational assessment scale or some of the ones we'll talk about shortly, the FAST. And the idea is there's a couple different analyses we, we would want to do. One would be if I administer the motivational assessment scale and you administer the motivational assessment scale to the same person, to the same parent reporting on their child, we should produce the same result if there's reliability in the tool, right? If, if I administer the tool and you administer the tool to the same parent and we have different results, then there could be a problem with the reliability of the tool. There are a couple other uh, tests you'd want to do for reliability, but this would be inter-rater reliability. Another one would be uh, if I administered the tool this week and then I administered it again next week, would it produce the same results? So a couple uh, analyses. Uh, I'm not going to review the methods, but they use some correlational analyses to, to generate the data. And these are the results. Uh, these are results that you won't see very often in behavioral analytic research, so I'm not going to go through them in great detail, but I will tell you they are correlational data. So uh, at zero in the middle here, there is no correlation. Uh, as you go down in the negatives, it's a negative correlation. And then uh, when you get toward one, it's a positive correlation. So you have sort of negative one at one end, zero, and then positive one. Scores zero to one, positive one are good. And you see that um, the reliability is pretty variable in, in you know, overall scores per category of question and then rank order. So what, what function is coming up highest? They're generally pretty good, uh, particularly category correlation and rank correlation. So great, mass is looking pretty good. The secondary analysis that Zarconi et al. did was what we call uh, identical agreement and adjacent agreement. So it's not particularly important you fully understand this to be you know, to, for the exam or the BCDA exam, but 
to explain it to you, here what we're doing is we're going to take two raiders, um, one, two from each setting. So there are two people completing the mass in an institution, four per participant, and two people in a school completing the mass for, again, for another participant. And we're, we're aggregating the scores of all, you know, the entire sample. Um, so the dark shaded bars are from the institutional sample, open bars are from the school sample. <clears throat> Identical agreement means that question by question, the two raters agreed upon the, the response. Now remember, this is a Likert scale, so it goes zero to seven. So they, they exactly agreed that, you know, I scored a, a one and you also scored a one, or I scored a five, you also scored a five per question. And there we see that identical agreement is very poor. Right to say it's good, we'd have to be eighty percent in agreement or higher. Anything less than that is is very poor, and you can see, um, obviously, down by zero percent is extremely poor. Adjacent agreement is allowing for um, you know some variation in the rating, right? So plus one or minus one. So in that case, if I scored a two but you scored a one or you scored a three, we'll count that because you know we're not too far off, right? So nevertheless, even with this less stringent score, the um, reliability or the agreement was poor. So Zarconi and all failed to replicate the findings of Duran and Crimin. Now, if you remember how we, we, we discussed science as being uh, a process by which we're conducting studies and if a result is replicated we become more confident in those findings if we fail to replicate results um, that's bad and you know maybe we'll ask why or maybe other folks will conduct a couple more studies to to ask why so where we are now with the motivational assessment scale is the utility is questionable um, Again, you know, I don't use this tool. I would recommend you do not use it. That said, I guarantee that when you are gaining experience doing functional behavior assessments, you will probably cross paths with somebody who is using the motivational assessment scale. Okay, just because it's widely distributed. The next tool we're going to talk about is the questions about behavioral function developed by Johnny Matson and Tim Bulmer. Uh, but we're going to talk about it in the context of an article that was conducted by uh, Theodosia Pekloski et al. in 2001. I'm not sure if I pronounced her last name right. But uh, her study was an assessment of the convergent validity of the QABF with the functional analysis as well as with the motivational assessment scale. So just to sort of set the, the, um, the grounds for this research, what they're doing here is they developed a new tool. There's a, I believe there's a publication before this showing the, the QABF, um, but it, it is a new tool. So they wanna compare its results to the results of the functional analysis, which is the gold standard, and the motivational assessment scale, which was uh, a tool that was being used, right? So now again, remember what we're looking for here is if I run, if I utilize a QABF on a client and it produces an outcome, I want to do the same thing with the motivational assessment scale and see what the outcome is, and then do the same thing with a functional analysis. And those outcomes across those three approaches should be the same. That would be correspondence. If there's lack of correspondence, um, then that's questionable, uh, particularly if the results of the new tool, the QABF, does not correspond with the functional analysis or gold standard. Okay, so again, we're trying, they're, they're trying to establish the validity of the new assessment tool. Okay, so this is just pure research, right? I'll talk about the implications for uh, practice at the end. So basically, in the introduction of the article, they discussed the three primary methods of a functional behavior assessment. 
indirect assessment, descriptive assessment, like antecedent behavior consequence data collection, and the experimental or functional analysis. And they note, based on some of the research at, that was already out at the time, that there is limitations to indirect assessment, questionable reliability and questionable validity, right? So again, remember, reliability is a couple ways we could assess it, but if I do the tool, if I apply the, the assessment tool on uh, this week and I do it again next week, it probably should produce the same results. If it produces different results, poor reliability. Another approach would be if I administer the assessment tool and you administer the assessment tool, they should produce the same results. Validity means that the tool is basically, we could say, functioning how we believe it should be functioning. So to test validity, we're going to compare the outcomes of produced by the new tool to the functional analysis. So if there's correspondence, it is a valid tool. So we set the purpose. They want to establish convergent validity of these three approaches or primarily the new tool, the QABF, to these existing tools. They had 13 participants, all of whom were diagnosed with a profound intellectual disability, all of whom engaged in some form of problem behavior like aggression, self-injury, tantrum, stereotypy, and those were defined uh, specifically for each participant. Then, of course, they conducted the different assessments, right? They utilized the protocol or procedures described by Iwata and all for their experimental analyses. They conducted the QABF and the motivational assessment scale. These tools were administered by graduate students um, that were blind to the uh, experimental analysis results. So they weren't aware of what the FA showed regarding the, the function of the, the problem behavior. So let's look at the QABF. Again, this was developed by Johnny Matson and Tim Vollmer. Um, Johnny Matson was, or maybe still is, at LSU. Tim Vollmer is actually a student of Brian Awadas. Uh, he was a faculty member at LSU for a couple of years during this time, and then he uh, now is a faculty at the University of Florida. So, uh, Tim Vollmer does some some great research. <clears throat> so this tool consisted of 25 questions, and the questions were designed to, to determine or identify behavior function according to four categories. And you know, again, what we're talking about here is the reinforcers. What are the reinforcers for the problem behavior? And we see that the four categories include social positive reinforcement in the form of attention, social positive reinforcement in the form of a tangible item, social negative reinforcement in the form of escape, and automatic positive reinforcement in the form of sensory stimulation. So uh, I will point out at this time that yes, you see even researchers just simply saying attention, tangible, escape, uh, sensory. Uh, I, I, you know, I want you as students and professionals to, to move away from that and just be be formal about it. Social positive reinforcement in the form of attention. You know, if you're talking with a colleague, it's probably okay to be a little more casual, but to uh, other audiences, we wanna be more professional. And the scoring is on a four point Likert scale from never to often. So this is a copy of the QABF. Uh, it, it, it probably is not an original copy. Um, the QABF, you technically have to order from Johnny Matson, and I believe it costs about 25 bucks. Um, but guaranteed, if you search online, you will find multiple formats or variations of that assessment. Uh, but it, my recommendation would be if you elect to use this tool, you probably should pay for it. I believe there's a, a copyright on it. So nevertheless, it, it's very similar to the motivational assessment scale, only the Likert scale is more narrow, right? Instead of a seven point Likert scale, it's a four point Likert scale, but very similar in that there are questions designed to get at the behavior's function. So for example, 
child engages in behavior to get attention. Never, rarely, sometimes, or often. They engage in the behavior to escape work or learning situations. Right, so we're simply uh, point blank asking parents and our teachers or caregivers, in your perception, why is a child doing the behavior? Right, and we're, we're sort of getting at these functions. So without getting uh, further into the details of how the study was conducted, we'll look at the results. So here um, they list the results in a table. So you have your participants down one column, the results of the analog sessions or the functional analysis sessions um, down at the second column, the results of the motivational assessment scale, uh, in the third and the results of the QABF. So what we're looking for here again is correspondence, meaning that if the analog assessment, for example, showed that attention and tangible were reinforcers, access social positive reinforcement uh, and access to attention or tangibles uh, was the outcome or the findings, the motivational assessment scale should have identified those as well as the QABF. So for participant one, we have correspondence across all three. Keep in mind this analog session or the functional analysis is the standard. So it's more important that the new tool aligns to, the, to that. Uh, for participant two, the analog sessions identified tangible and escape as reinforcers. The motivational assessment scale only identified tangible. The QABF identified tangible and escape. So we have correspondence from the QABF to the analog assessment. No correspondence with the motivational assessment scale. The uh, participant three, the results were undifferentiated. So they were not clear. But the motivational assessment scale and the QABF both identified attention as the reinforcer. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but uh, hopefully I, I set you up with uh, the knowledge of how to read this table. We'll, we'll look at one more. Um, here, the analog reinforcement for participant 10 showed, or the analog sessions rather, showed automatic reinforcement. The motivational assessment scale also showed mo automatic reinforcement, but the um, QABF showed escape. Okay, and then they do uh, some statistics, Spearman rank order correlations. We're not going to go through those, but uh, ultimately what we end up with is, I'll come back to these results. The agreement scores were low uh, between the assessments. The QABF and the FA matched or corresponded for 56.3% of the cases. The MA and the F, the MAS and the FA, correspondent 43%, pretty low. QABF in the mass correspondent 61%. So I, I think the, the uh, more important findings here are right here. That's pretty low, 56% correspondence, right? So they're saying the QABF agreement to the FA was lower than ideal, but it was better than the motivational assessment scale. Um, not a big surprise there, but what we're left with is, well, well, the implication of this, consider consider it in this way, sort of just uh, simply. If we were to take 10 individuals and only run the QABF, there's chances that we would only identify the function for five of them, roughly, you know, and the rest we would miss. Right, so maybe we get a false positive or a false negative, and that could have serious implications for treatment. We could design a treatment that worsens the behavior. So 56% is not good, but they, they hang on to it and say, well, at least it was better than the motivational assessment scale. Um, let's go through the FA results just to, to have more practice looking at these type of results. And I'm not gonna go through all of them, but um, we'll kind of go through a few. So here's the results for one of the participants. It looks like they're measuring the rate of self-injurious behavior per minute on the y-axis. 
sessions are along the x-axis and they conducted a toy play or a control condition, the demand condition, the attention condition, and the alone. And these results show that problem behavior only occurred in the alone condition. So this is showing an automatic reinforcement function. Okay, right? Clearly, we did not see problem behavior in any of the other conditions. Um, down here, we have the rate of self-injurious behavior for another participant, uh, a couple different conditions, control or toy play, demand, attention, alone, and a tangible condition. The results were inconclusive, but if you remember from that Vollmer study, when you get undifferentiated results, one thing you should do is run repeated no interaction, or in this case, alone conditions. And when they did that, the behavior maintained, right? When there's no social consequences in this condition, the self-injurious behavior is still occurring. So that confirms an automatic reinforcement hypothesis, right? Because the behavior is occurring when there's no social reinforcement available. Okay, let's go over to this side. Um, so here again, sessions on the X, rate of aggressive responding on the Y uh, per minute, toy plays are controlled, demand, attention, and tangible. Um, here, we see results that look inconclusive early on or undifferentiated. As we go on, it seems that the demand condition is uh, resulting in the highest levels of challenging behavior, highest levels of regression. So we might be inclined to say, well, it's a social negative reinforcement function in the form of escape. Uh, it looks like because there is a downward trend here, the um, the researchers maybe wanted to be conservative, so they did something else. I don't, I don't recall what they did here, but it looks like they did one more comparison just to confirm that yes, in fact, um, the function is social negative reinforcement. Okay, uh, just to, to highlight some of these other data, right? Here's one where there's no responding. Maybe it was a case that the, the assessment conditions did not simulate enough what was happening in the natural environment. Here's one where we see a lot of responding in the beginning, but then zero, right? What do we do there? Uh, well, if the, the parents or teachers are saying, no, something's wrong, they clearly engage in problem behavior, then we might wanna rethink our analysis the way we're conducting it. Um, Here's one again that kind of difficult to read. You see undifferentiated responding here. It's, you know, it would concern me that you do have somewhat consistent levels of problem behavior in the demand condition, but it seems more probable that this automatic reinforcement um, alone condition is producing more problem behavior. I wouldn't be convinced here. I'd probably run some repeated alone session so kind of you know difficult to make sense of these results are pretty clear it seems that problem behavior is uh, maintained by social positive reinforcement in the form of access to a tangible item it is possible that this the, the problem behavior occurring in the demand is influential because again it's sort of consistently higher than some of the other uh, conditions and it's actually on an increasing trend, right? So I may, uh, as a practitioner, I probably would, you know, maybe do a couple more sessions to, to follow this out. Okay, so take home point, uh, QABF is okay. There's actually a couple more studies. Uh, I, I don't recall if the results have improved, but it's one of the assessment tools for which there's a fair bit of data. And again, if we use it as a starting point or part of our process of interview paired with a QABF, that's fine as long as we verify via functional analysis what the QABF showed, right? So I, I utilize tools like this, but um, it's not my ending point.
Okay, the other tool I want to uh, review is the functional analysis screening tool developed by um, Awada, um, Brian Awada and Isar de Leon. The actual publication uh, that was assigned was Awada de Leon and Roscoe. And in that article, they basically, again, much like the other ones, indicate that indirect assessment uh, does provide a consistent format for interviewing the, these tools like the QABF. It sort of provides you with the questions you should be asking. It doesn't require a lot of skill to complete it, and they tend to be very efficient, you know, roughly 15 minutes to, to fill out the form. So uh, along this trend of developing these forms, Brian Awada and colleagues thought, well, we're in a prime position to develop a form because we developed the functional analysis. So um, the development of the FAST was designed to supplement the FA. Now that that's critical. They're not saying to replace the FA, they're saying to supplement the FA. So it's a screening tool. And again, it, it will help us or guide us of how to arrange our functional analysis. And it includes a structured interview format. And the development was based on empirical research. So not unlike the other tools, they test for specific sources of reinforcement. But different than the other tools, they don't necessarily delineate a difference between social positive reinforcement in the form of attention and social positive reinforcement in the form of access to a tangible. Um, it, it's probably debatable if that distinction is important for treatment. Social negative reinforcement, automatic positive, and automatic negative. So they actually delineate between these two uh, within the assessment tool. Uh, in a functional analysis, we don't even delineate between both of these. So that's sort of interesting. But again, it's the tool is designed to shape the functional analysis, right? Are we going to run four test conditions, or I'm sorry, three test conditions in a control, or maybe just one versus control, or two versus control? So when you complete the FAST, the therapist or the BCBA interviews or provides the tool to caregivers and teachers. Again, I prefer to, you, to use the tool and interview, like ask the questions that are on the form. And it's three parts, and I'll show you one shortly. Part one is it's descriptive, um, descriptive information. You'll see what that is. Part two are the assessment questions the ones designed to get at the function. And in part three, you summarize the scores. The, um, the validity of using a tool like this may be increased if you have the tool completed by more than one respondent. What I mean by that is if you only complete the tool with one person, like the teacher, you, you you can't really gauge how accurate that information is. If you completed it with the teacher as well as the teacher's aide, then you could at least see if there's correspondence between the two respondents' questions, and that might help increase your confidence in the information you received. Okay, I hope, I hope that makes sense. Uh, if we were to complete it with three people and they all produce the same results, then we were pretty confident. If there's differences, then we're, we're like, you know, this information is not good. And as we know, indirect information is subjective. Uh, the scoring summary, I want you to pay close attention to this. I'll show you an example. But to score, you have to consider there are four questions per function, and it's laid out sort of in a linear fashion, which I'll point out. You're, you're calculating the number of questions the respondent answered yes, divide up by the four questions per the function, right? So two out of five, two out of four would be 50%. Scores 75% or higher indicate that that particular variable or function may be influential. 50% or lower may not be, or is not, or may not be influential. And then you can have obviously some scores in between if you do the the uh, questionnaire with more than one person. So here's a questionnaire. Uh, I'll actually upload a copy of this. Some of you may already have it. And it gives some directions, uh, the client, the informant who's answering the questions, the interviewer. 
and um, you're going to go through this part one. Indicate your relationship to the person. Are you a parent, an instructor, or a therapist? How long have you known the person? That's important, right? Because if I'm going to ask you these questions, but you've only known the person a month, you probably don't have an extensive history, extensive enough history to, to answer um, accurately. Do you interact with the person daily? Under what situations do you interact with the person? And then you get into the, the problem behaviors. You know, what are the targets? And you could define them. Um, what are the frequency? Do they occur hourly, daily, weekly, or less often? Uh, the severity. And again, this is all subjective. Situations in which the problem behavior is most likely to occur versus less likely. Um, you know, what are the antecedents? What are the consequences? And are there any current treatments? So this is sort of just a simple structured interview. These are some questions you would probably want to ask whether you're using this uh, tool or not. Then you get into the questions. And as I mentioned, there are four questions per function. Right? I don't know why I did this because you can see down here. These are the questions per function. And essentially, we're simply asking a parent, does a problem behavior occur when the person is receiving attention or caregivers are paying attention to somebody else or is not receiving attention rather? Um, maybe the parent answers yes. Does a problem behavior occur when the person's request for preferred items or activities are denied? We'll say no. So we're simply going through in this way. Uh, we'll point out a couple other ones related to automatic reinforcement. Um, does a problem behavior occur even when nobody is nearby or watching? Well, let's just say the behavior is aggression. So this question probably wouldn't be appropriate. Um, we'll look at another one. Does problem behavior appear to be a form of self-stimulation? Let's just say it's self-injury. Maybe yes. The other ones at social negative reinforcement does a person have recurring painful conditions like ear infections or allergies? Yes. So we're simply going through uh, interviewing a parent and they're responding yes or no. Now, one of the things you, you, you probably could already pick up on is that there's no Likert scale. We're only going yes or no, or maybe the question just is not applicable to the target behavior. So in that sense, uh, the reliability of the tool should be pretty good because there's, you know, you only have two options, essentially. Okay, here's your scoring summary. So again, um, if I were to score two down here, uh, that would be 50%, right? If I were to score, you know, one, 25%, or let's just say three, 75%, or you could simply just put the number two, three, and so forth. I'm going to show you another way that, that <clears throat> I was taught by Dr. Wada how to calculate, and uh, I think it's a preferred method. So here's the table showing the results of the functional analysis screening tool. Uh, typically, I would include one of these in a full FBA report or a report or progress note from my um, interviews or sessions, and um, the table would look exactly like this. I would indicate who the respondents were. You know, maybe it would have the mother's name, the father's name, teacher, or I might say mother, father, teacher, or we could have respondent one, two, and three. Probably better to be a little more precise about that. Um, if this were a report, I'll show you how to write reports at another time, but this would show, this would describe that interviews were conducted, a functional analysis screening tool was conducted with these respondents on this particular date. I'd indicate what the tool is designed to do and a variety of other pieces of information. But more importantly, this is showing each respondent's results in each of the uh, reinforcement categories. So remember, there are four questions per category. So respondent one answered yes to four of the questions for social positive reinforcement. Respondent two answered yes, or I'm sorry, respondent one answered yes to two of the questions for social negative reinforcement and so forth. Then I'm going to summarize the scores for all of the respondents as a percentage. And it's simply a couple ways you go about doing it. 
four out of four would be 100% for respondent one, 100% for respondent two, 100% for respondent three, which is 100%. Or you could go 50%, 50%, 25%, and divide it by the three. So again, the calculation is as follows, right? You can do it this way. Two out of four is 50%. 50%, 25% um, would equal out to 42%. Otherwise, you could go, you know, the uh, 5 divided by 12 <clears throat> be another way to, to develop that percentage. Okay. So getting back to the actual article by De Leon, Awada, and Roscoe, what was done initially was a reliability analysis, and we've already discussed reliability analyses. So for 151 individuals totaling in 196 targeted behaviors, they assessed inter-rater reliability item by item, so question by question, and agreement scores per category. So, you know, across raters, did they agree <clears throat> item by item? And the results were 71.5% uh, with a range of 28.6 to 100% uh, and 64% on the overall outcome. That's not great reliability, uh, but better than some of the other studies we looked at. In study two, they conducted the validity assessment. So again, recall that when we are determining the validity of a new tool, a new assessment tool, we are going to compare it to a standard, in this case, the functional analysis. So they did that for 59 individuals. They had their total 69 assessments, multiple target behaviors. So this is a pretty substantial study. And they compared the results of the FAST to the results of the FA. Now, again, I want you to keep in mind, this is for um, each of these individuals. So of these 59 individuals, for one individual, they completed the FAST, and they also completed the FA, and we're looking for correspondence between those two uh, outcomes. Across all of the individuals in the 69 assessments, the correspondence was about 70.8. So of these, 50, well, let's go with, of these 69 assessments, 70.8% of them corresponded. That's pretty good, but you know, generally we, we look we kind of have a, a bar of 80% or higher for most things. So 70% 70, 70 isn't bad, but you know, above 80 would be better. So here's some examples of the results. And I think, again, it'll be useful to go through these <clears throat> just to show you one, uh, you know, how, we're, how we're analyzing these functional analysis data. Uh, <clears throat> and then of course the data from the FAST. So the data from the FAST are shown above the each graph so you have two raters right and your uh, four reinforcement categories social positive social negative automatic positive automatic negative and the responses again <clears throat> those responses answered yes so you know we could even look at the reliability here and have correspondence there no correspondence here no correspondence here but regardless so uh, it looks like this one would probably be indicating a social positive reinforcement function. So when you look at the functional analysis data, there's correspondence. It's not the most clear data, but by and large, you see the attention condition producing the most problem behavior. Okay, uh, we'll come down here and we again uh, here are your FAST data. We see that the FAST indicated a social negative reinforcement function, and the functional analysis data indicate that function as well, right? So when you look at a panel like this, one of the things we're doing is you could see the conditions labeled up here, right? So the triangles are demand. So I know down here the triangles are also demand. Moving over to examples of non-correspondence, here if we look at the FAST, 
Um, it looks like it identified multiple functions, social positive and automatic positive, but the FA only shows an attention function, <clears throat> social positive reinforcement in the form of attention, does not show any maintenance by automatic reinforcement. So uh, we would call this, the, the, the results of the FAST, a false positive. It identified something as influential that actually was not influential. So that is a false positive. If it failed to show the, auto, the social positive reinforcement function, we would call that a false negative. <clears throat> okay, coming down here for Albert, um, it looks like social positive reinforcement is the indicated function according to the FAST but the FA shows that it's actually a social negative reinforcement function. So lack of correspondence there. So the, the outcome of this study, and, and this was a, a long study. In fact, I remember when I was in graduate school um, years ago, collecting some of the data for this study. Um, I, I think Dr. Iwata was trying to make a point because he had seen a variety of things. He'd seen the, the, sort of prevalence of these indirect assessment tools being used in place of a functional analysis. And um, he had actually seen the functional analysis screening tool replicated, or we would say plagiarized multiple times, in some instances, incorrectly plagiarized. So that was a problem too. So I think he wanted to, you know, obviously that the study was important to do, but the, the implications that were revealed from this study is that the reliability and validity compared well with other reports, but it's, it's just not adequate for developing treatment. This is not an ending point for a functional behavior assessment. It is the beginning point, right? However, even though it's not adequate for developing treatment, it is useful because there's a structured interview and it can serve as a basis for follow-up questions and observations. And it informs the design of the FA. Um, just to, to really clarify that, what we're talking about is if my FAST shows possible the possible influence of social positive reinforcement and social negative reinforcement, but not automatic reinforcement, maybe I don't run the alone condition in a functional analysis. Or perhaps in another example, the FAST shows that um, social negative reinforcement only seems to be, is the, is the only function that seems to be influential. Um, then maybe I just run a demand condition compared to a control condition. So again, the tool has utility in that it, it's guiding us what questions to ask and it's, allowing us to begin to generate a hypothesis about what's maintaining the targeted behavior. So here's where we are with practice. Indirect assessment is the first step in an FBI. I would say you will always conduct interviews and you will probably likely always utilize um, a rating scale tool like the FAST or the QABF. Uh, I, I, I should refrain from recommending one, but I typically use the FAST. Again, it's from all the data that are out there, one is not better than the other. Um, although, well, I, I take that back. Uh, both the QABF and the FAST seem to be better than the motivational assessment scale, but um, you know, you could use what you want, but the, the, we should always be practicing according to evidence-based practice. So QABF has some evidence. Um, you know, I'm only using the FAST as a starting point, so it's not problematic at all. We're always going to interview. We're always going to review records. The structured interview tools are helpful. If you want to use one, use one. Uh, they're just not sufficient for developing treatments. We have to observe the behavior and we have to test the hypotheses uh, uh, regarding what reinforcer or reinforcers are maintaining problem behavior. So the end goal is to identify the function and indirect assessments or descriptive assessments do not do that. 
So therefore they're not sufficient for designing treatment. Okay, that is the end.